This is the Pet Buzz. This is the Pet Buzz. And here's the Dynamic Dynamic Pet Pet Duo. When a medical emergency strikes, just how financially prepared are you? Our next guest is going to help us provide a strategy for just these times. Joining us today is Rob Jackson, co-founder and CEO at Healthy Paws Pet Insurance and Healthy Paws Foundation. So greetings, Rob. Welcome to the Pet Buzz. Uh, thank you. And it's nice to be with you. You know, I, I'm, I'm really glad you're doing this interview because so many people have questions about pet insurance. So I'm glad that you're going to be here to answer some of them. So why is pet insurance support important, especially now for pet owners? Well, some of the things that have been going on recently, uh, the advances in veterinary medicine have been fantastic. I mean, there's hardly a thing we can't do for our four-legged family members that we can do for our two-legged family members. But the cost of those procedures has gone up dramatically. And it's overwhelming sometimes. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, so all of a sudden, you know, your four-legged family member is in a situation where they need, uh, you know, uh, kidney failure uh, treatment or cancer or, God, they're at the dog park and they blow out a cruciate chasing one of those chocolate balls and all of a sudden, the procedure that they're looking for to repair the cruise ship is $4,500. And, you know, so there's there's kind of a shock from that standpoint. And so I guess the best thing, what I would say is the reason why you'd want to consider pet insurance is to make sure that you can always provide the very best veterinary medicine and best veterinary treatment for your dog and not have your pocketbook or, cat. or your cat. Exactly. Uh, and, and, uh, I'll, I'll keep it just the four-legged family member <laughs> there, that, that way we'll, we'll be inclusive, uh, just, just to make sure that you can always provide that without having to have your pocketbook, you know, restrict you and prevent you from being able to offer the best possible veterinary care. Do you think COVID comes into play specifically now? I mean, especially, you know, post COVID finances where I think as a nation, people are struggling. You know, it's interesting. Um, Last year when COVID hit, we were thinking, oh, my goodness, uh, you know, this is a, um, you know, pet health insurance seems to be more of a voluntary play. And, uh, you know, we thought we were going to see a, you know, um, a reduction in the number of folks that would be considering it. But the exact opposite happened. This was a time when people were saying, you know, I'm working from home. Maybe this is a time for us to bring a four-legged family member in. And so a phenomenon took place. My gosh, all the shelters were uh, absolutely bare because everybody was adopting. Uh, And as a result, we started seeing, uh, you know, a fairly large spike of people uh, looking into uh, the pet insurance again to protect themselves uh, to make sure that that you know, family members. So it's been an interesting one. I, I think you know uh, pet parents usually buy pet health insurance. Pet owners do not, and a pet owner would sort of consider the pet to be property. And if something happens, I'll replace it. But a pet parent considers that pet a family member. I always say is if the pet is sleeping up in your your bed bedroom and it's up in your bed Mm -hmm. and it's spooning you, you probably need pet health insurance. So uh, so I'm thinking that even during the pandemic, when, you know, money is there a little bit tight, um, if if that pet is considered a family member, uh, people are finding a way to make sure that they're protected. I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of curious because I think, um, you know, I, back in the day, I was an old VI, VPI person, as many people were when pet insurance got started. Right. Um, but, you know, what, one of the things that I'm, I'm always I'm still surprised at is that pet insurance has had a very, very slow growth, mm-hmm. especially in this particular country, um, mm-hmm. whereas in Europe and especially the UK, not so much. Um, why do you think that is? Well, you know, I, I think it has a little bit to do with some of the, the social aspect in the UK where, you know, healthcare is more of a social and it's a right rather than a privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we sometimes uh, are held back a little bit by 
people thinking, well, nobody's going to dictate to me. And, you know, I, I think it's still sort of a voluntary play. Um, again, uh, there are a hundred million pets out there, you know, it, it, look, uh, we've got, uh, out, out of 125 million households, uh, you know, you've got almost 80 million of them having a pet in there, but that is not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily equate to those are homes that a, 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 uh, that you have a pet parent. And so, you know, when you really look at it, you know, we're st starting to see that phenomena of pet parents sort of uh, growing. And so when you really look at it, if, if the people that are going to actually purchase pet health insurance are more pet parents versus pet owners, then as a percentage of those, it's starting to rise. You know, maybe we're looking at out of the 85 million households that have pets in them, maybe 30 or 35 million are, you know, pet parents. I think two two really interesting things you brought up. The first is um, the differences in just cultural and social outlook versus here in Europe, because I think that's really important. I had an interview yeah. um, last week uh, with uh, Professor Robbie McDonald, and we were talking about a study that he had done about uh, reducing predatory cat behavior. And we talked about the differences in the outlooks between Americans and specifically, you know, outdoor cats versus indoor cats and how more English, uh, according to him, um, I didn't necessarily disagree, but agree, but how more English folks are letting their cats out. So that was one thing. The other thing is I always, it, that, that kind of just triggered something, what you said. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, and it brings me back to an old hotel analogy, but when you said pet parents versus having a pet, because, you know, there's a difference between being pet friendly and pet accommodating, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that's, um, you know, in the scheme of thing, I think it's really important. And I'm glad I'm glad that you brought that up yeah. um, because I think that gives people, you know, it, it, it forces people to think about who they are as a pet owner, whether you're a pet parent or whether you're a pet owner. But let's get back to some of these questions that I, I sent to you because yeah. uh, I think they're uh, I think they're interesting and I'm in waiting to hear your responses. So I think before signing up for pet insurance, you know, what does a pet owner need to know? And I'm going to start this by saying, is pet insurance really like human insurance? Um, the, the one difference is in your human insurance, you are going to be covered for a lot of your preventative care. Mm -hmm. right? uh, pet insurance really should be insuring the unexpected, okay. you know, accidents and illnesses. You don't want to insure preventative care because that would be like insuring the oil changes on your car. You wouldn't do that. That's just part of, you know, sort of smart, smart maintenance on it. So to try and, and, and really look at it, what, you're, what, it, what does it cover? It should cover the unexpected. And it's, if it's an accident or an illness, so long as the clinical signs or symptoms are not present prior to enrollment, it's going to be covered. And that's, if, we're, if, if, if we were looking at it to try and get the best and most economic, you know, coverage for the, I would look at trying to get a comprehensive plan that covers accidents and illnesses uh, and, and leave the preventative care, because there are some companies that do have that, mm -hmm. leave that to your own pocketbook. There's no sense in having a third party manage your pocketbook. It just becomes costly when you have to send in for a reimbursement, you know, uh, of, of forty dollars that you could have paid yourself on, on that. Sure. So, so a catastrophic. I, I, well, unexpected. Unexpected. Because yeah. catastrophic sometimes uh, it could be serious. You know, it could be anything from a bee sting all the way up to cancer, right? right. But it's unexpected. Okay. And I, I will say, that, you know we process hundreds of thousands of claims, you know, uh, on a monthly basis. And there's a lot of little stuff, ear infections, allergies, and things like that. Charlie, you cannot believe the number of increase in the claims where a pet is going into the hosp emergency hospital for five or six days. And that's like 15 to $20,000. Sure. And, and, and so that's the one where, you know, with all the procedures, and by the way, they come out and they're good. You know, they're, they're living, well, you know, so uh, recently had uh, six dogs and a cat and a bird. So mm -hmm. uh, right now I've lost three dogs in three and a half months. So mm -hmm. I am and lived in New York City 
and yeah. I live in Florida. So I am very familiar with the rising cost of pet yeah. care. Yeah. Um, so what does an insurance cover? I mean, for the most part, I mean, I know we talked about that you can pick and choose what you want, but for the most part, if you, you know, you have a dog and, you know, things that come up, what, what, what do on the not covered, what should pet, uh, pet parents be aware of? Well, it's not going to cover pre-existing conditions. Okay. Okay. So if the clinical signs or symptoms were noted in the medical records before enrollment or during the waiting period, it's not going to be covered. Okay. Right. And, and that's obvious too, because otherwise people would just wait around till something happens. And then it'd be like trying to insure your house uh, when it's, when it's already on fire, you know, you, you, you wouldn't do that. Right. Um, so, but again, so it's accidents and illnesses, right? That's what you're really looking at. It's the unexpected. So. And I also think, it's I also think, um, and I'm a, a firm believer in this because I find too many people don't do this. You know, when you buy, especially a purebred dog, make sure you understand what could possibly happen to that dog. I mean, for example, back in the day, and I guess uh, in the 80s and 90s, people were buying Burmese mountain dogs like there was no tomorrow. And they are subject to hip dysplasia like so many other breeds are. So before buying your dog, make sure it's a good idea that you know what health conditions could come up correct? Correct. And I would even say before rescuing your dog, mm -hmm. um, because there are, you know, every year there's, you know, 8 million cats and dogs that go into shelters and uh, up until the pandemic, you know, only half of them were coming out. So, um, you know, there are a lot of great rescue dogs that are looking for a forever, forever home there too. And oftentimes a rescue um, sometimes doesn't he have as many issues as a purebred dog just because of some of the genetics have been neutralized by the, uh, the fact that they were consummated at a, uh, a dog party. <laughs> sure, or a dog park. Okay, yeah. so I think one, so one of the questions I know a lot of people are curious is, how does it work? I mean, you take your pet to the, the vet and then, yeah. so how does the claims work? What do you have to file? Because I think yeah, sometimes, it's a, today we live in a world where, Paperwork seems to be so overwhelming for yeah. people. Yeah. I, mean, I guess it's, I was at that age where, you know, I did it. So it's like, it's not so yeah. overwhelming for me. It's, it's, a, it's a reimbursement play. So you go ahead, you put the credit card down, you pay the vet. And then uh, it depends upon the actual company you're with. Uh, you know, there are many companies that have apps that you can just take an invoice, you know, picture of the invoice push Smith. And th there it is. It's as easy as pie on that. There are some companies that still have quite a bit of paper mark and that th those are all things that you should probably investigate prior to uh, making the choices. How easy is the claim process? And usually you can check that out too with customer reviews. They'll, they'll usually tell you right there, oh my gosh, you know, I had the claim. It was so easy. And, and then, you know, I, I, I push submit and, you know, within 48 hours, uh, you know, the, the money was back in my, my account. We love that quick and easy getting reimbursed. Absolutely. So talk to a little bit about how pet parents can identify the best uh, insurance policy for their four-legged family members. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of choices out there now. And I think what you probably want to do is go to some of the review sites to kind of check out what uh, independent experts are, are saying about the companies. Uh, I think customer reviews are extremely important. Um, you know, what, what fellow pet parents are saying and the reasons why, you know, they would vouch for a company. Um, again, you're looking for comprehensive coverage for accidents and illnesses without limits. You probably don't want to have per incident limits or annual limits. Uh, uh, or lifetime limits, because if you do have great coverage, the last thing you want to do is have it run out because all of a sudden a limit, you know, you hit the limit on that. So, um, but I, I, I would say that uh, it, it can be confusing if you just go to any particular company site, obviously every company is going to say that they're the greatest, which is the reason why you probably want to go to the independent review sites just to, you know, get a, a, a little bit more of an independent view on that. So, Everything is online. It's all digital. You know, you can just type in pet insurance and what's going to pop up is, you know, the various companies that are available. I 
think it's also a good idea to talk to your vet. I mean, you know, at this point, like many businesses, um, and vets have always, I, I guess, guilty of, have been guilty of this, you know, they've always kind of kept their practice very closed. And now to survive, they have to know about pet products. They have to know about pet insurance because these questions come up during the course of any, di- any given examination, annual examination or a, a visit stop by. And, you know, vets belong to various organizations and sometimes um, their rep- reps will come in and talk to them about various insurance forms. And, you know, they're the ones collecting money. So, you know, obviously it's a business, they're in business to make money, but they want to be able to offer the best um, recommendations for their clients as well. So I think you might want to, you know, talk it over with your vet. As yep. well. I think that's always a, Absolutely. a good point. But reviews, I think, are very, very key. And I'm glad that you mentioned them more than once because I think people need to get used to the process of looking at reviews today. Um, yes. Par for the course, whether you're getting pet insurance or whether you decide to go into Best Buy and buy a television, it's just very helpful. Um, another question um, Why do you feel that it's important to obtain pet insurance early in a pet's life? That's a great question. You, you, you almost want to get coverage when the pet is in the starting gate of life. And what's the reason for that? You'd like to eliminate the impact of any pre-existing conditions. And so the earlier you get it, the less likely anything is going to have happened. So now what you're going to do is you're going to have lifetime coverage that is going to be you know, comprehensive and complete and unrestricted. So it's not so, oh, let's lock in the rate. That's not really, it's sometimes people will tell you that. No, because over the life of the pet, the premiums are probably going to go up. But what you really would like to do is if the if you're going to pay a premium, you'd like to have the maximum coverage. And if your coverage is not restricted by pre-existing conditions, that's you've got the, the best possible coverage. You know, I think the last question I have for you is more of a financial one, um, because research has shown that many of us, of course, are worried about our finances, especially, you know, during and as we're leading out of the the pandemic. And, you know, pet care expenses vary from city to city and to state to state. And I think that's very important. I think every year um, on the show for the last five years, we've always had Wallet Hub come on and they do this state by state analysis of uh of finances and what people are spending as well as, you know, other things like who has the best dog parks or wherever. But I think, um, I think we also have to balance the need for monthly payments with uncertain financial futures. I mean, most market indicators are predicting hard times until about 2024. So give me a little of insights uh, as to what you're thinking regarding, regarding that. Well, I think the first thing is that pet insurance is not an investment, it's protection, right? And so that's that's very important to know because sometimes people say, well, that's not a very good investment. No, uh, buying fire insurance is not an investment, it's protection, you know? So the same thing, what you'd like to do is you hope that you're going to purchase this and never have to use it because <laughs> then your pet is happy and healthy and you don't have to go through the trauma on that. So, you know, I, I guess it really comes down to, you know, the degree of pet parent and, and how much that four-legged family member is a family member. And you just want to make sure that if something ever happens, God forbid, that is unexpected, uh, you, you never want to have your finances compromise the type of coverage or the type of treatment that your pet can receive on that. So, you know, it's, it's a balancing act, but uh, I think like anything, and and you brought it up when you're bringing home a pet, you need to be aware of the total costs. And that's not only the food and the care and the bed and all that, but also the the care and feeding, uh, you know, from that stand, it's a family member. And so, um, you know, I, I, I guess the, there are coverages out there that hopefully can fit everybody's budget. You know, what you may be ending up doing is, is getting coverage where you might take more risk on the back end by taking a higher deductible, which gives you a lower premium. And what you're saying is, okay, I'm going to cover the frequency, but if something bad or serious happens, then I know 
that I've got coverage, you know, at 90%. So that, those are some of the things that you can do is to take a look at that reimbursement and deductible level to figure out how that can fit into your budget. Well, Rob, thanks so much for joining us today. We totally are glad that you're here and giving us some insight into why we should have pet insurance. My pleasure, Charlotte. Great uh, sharing time with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pet Buzz. 